saw that there were, in the second half of Mark 7, there were two, count them, two miracles uh, that were so important, and they were awesome. The first was casting the demon out of a young girl after the mom was appealing to Jesus. You remember this? Constant appealing. She wouldn't give up. She was begging. And the mom was basically saying, I, listen, I might not be an Israelite, but I know that you have power enough, and I need your help now. And Jesus said, acknowledged in, in her faith in the book of Matthew, um, she said, blessed are you with that faith. And with that faith, indeed, freedom uh, hit that host, uh, household. The second was the healing of a man who was deaf, as well as having a speech impediment. Other texts say that he was mute. Um, Jesus had arrived in town. There's a group of people who brought this man to Jesus. And uh, it says that they were begging Jesus to lay, their hand, lay his hand on this man. And Jesus prayed, and we talked about this, with a sigh, with a groan. Uh, with the depth of his heart, the man was healed. And the key factor in both of those was intercession. Intercession. The worship and prayer that's accomplished by others uh, on behalf of those who cannot pray. People standing in the gap. I'm going to keep on praying for you, and I'm not going to stop until we see God at work in our lives, both of our lives. And we encourage you to be following this scripture. And in Galatians 6, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so my prayer for you is that you would have been an intercessor this week, that the Lord would be speaking to your heart about this, and that not just this one week and one week only, but throughout your life there'd be a change and that you would be walking it as an intercessor. And I trust that the Lord has grown you as a result of this. It's, it's vital. And if you were not here, I encourage you to listen to the study on YouTube. It's there for you and... Uh, and go from there. There's a lot here in our text today, and our, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Mark, but I'm, I've chosen just a small section of, the, of this text, and I'm going to keep the main thing the main thing, because even within 21 verses, there's so many rabbit trails we could go on. I don't want to go there, but I want to keep the main thing the main thing. I'll let you do the rabbit trails on your own at home, all right? Um, but let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we are called here to comprehend to understand what you're saying to us lord we sometimes we hear what you're saying but we don't understand your will and we pray god that your will your plan would be very clear to us and lord we we know we make mistakes we know that we're sinners but father your will your plan your your direction is perfect and so lord help us to understand that today Help us to hear your voice and to walk in it. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. And Lord, I pray that you're, as your Holy Spirit ministers to each one in this room and who are, who are listening all over the country right now, there are people listening to this. I pray, Father, that you, Father, would speak to each heart. There are people hurting today. Minister your, your comfort, the God of all comfort, your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. So, to set the context a little bit, um, we, previously we read uh, about Jesus traveling 120 miles, most of that by foot, um, and he started his trip out in Israel, you can see this on the map, and he started going northwest to this pagan land, this area called Tyre and Sidon. Um, that's today's Lebanon, is that area, right up on the coast of the Mediterranean. And then after ministering to the mother and the young daughter, he said to his disciples, hey, time to head south. So they head southwest, and they go to another Gentile land, which is called Decapolis. It's a region of ten cities, t Deca, ten, Decapolis, ten cities. It's a, actually, it's a country within a country. Uh, it's interesting because they had their own army, they had their own court system, they had their own currency and money, they even had their own culture and how they did culture and life. And it was a country within a country. And we remember this place as the place where the demon-possessed man, back in chapter 5, was told by Jesus, go back to your family and friends and share what has happened in your life. Go back to them and talk about it. And that's exactly what happened. He was a missionary to this family. 
And so Jesus and the disciples are now in Decapolis, and it's, note, it's on the east side of the Jordan River, which is Gentile land. And our text today begins with the feeding of the 4,000. You've heard of the 5,000, but this is the feeding of the 4,000. So some scholars actually think that there's, this is the same miracle as 5,000 versus 4,000. They just kind of got the numbers mixed up. Um, different time, so forth. Uh, we read the other one in chapter 6. But in, in fact, Jesus even verifies later in today's text that these were two unique events. And before we read this, I just want to highlight a few of the key thoughts uh, for you to keep an eye out for. The first is, the first miracle was in Israel. The second miracle was in Gentile land. The first miracle had five loaves and two fish, and that was from a young boy, his lunch. The second was seven loaves and a few fish from the disciples. The first event had fed 5,000 men. The second event fed 4,000. The first had 12 small lunch baskets left over. The second event had seven large baskets left over. And there's more and more details. I could fill up a couple of pages here, but that's, that's some good, strong highlights for you to just get your fingers around. Uh, that gives you the idea. But um, they were definitely two unique events. They're not the same events. Not the same. It wasn't just repeated. Let's pick it up in Mark chapter 8, verse 1. Here, here we go. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to, him, said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they now have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. They've been listening to Jesus for three days, and now he just felt bad for them. Not that they had to listen to him go on and on, but he just felt bad for them. They must be tired. They must be hungry. We get the idea um, that they were patient here for three days. They doesn't, we don't get the idea that they were complaining, uh, but that they were patient. Doesn't tell us any differently, I guess. Now, I don't know, but would you sit patiently for three days and listen to me or someone else drone on and on? Or they, be honest. Yes. I'm, thank you for your honesty. But I had an experience like this myself. Something like this, anyway, a flavor of it. Back when I was in my early 20s, I was a youth pastor, and I was uh, living in Pasadena, California. And I went to Long Beach, California, for a youth leaders conference. And there were 13,000 people in this arena in Long Beach. It's right there in the center of town. There's one man speaking. He spoke for three hours on Monday night. I would drive about an hour each way through traffic. I'd drive an hour, listen for three hours, and drive home an hour. And I did that Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. You have to be in your 20s to make that trip, you know. Uh, but I listened to that. And then Friday, I was there for 10 hours listening to one man. And then Saturday, I was there for eight hours. You might say, Jim, you're nuts. No, the content was excellent. It's exactly what I needed. It held my attention. It was, it was a long time, but there were 13,000 people with me. I wasn't just nuts. I mean, you can just imagine that their attention, these folks are listening to Jesus for three days, and you can just imagine their attention was focused now on the greatest teacher that ever lived. How awesome is that? This is similar to what's written about in chapter 6. Uh, a large crowd is very hungry. We see that both places. Jesus has compassion. We see that in both places. And the original text says that Jesus had pity on the crowd, had pity on them. He's sympathetic. They haven't eaten anything at all. And Jesus said in your text, verse 3, And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way for some of them have come from afar. Jesus here is inferring that they might not make it back to their own houses. 
back to their own homes or their own, their own territories, their own cities. Remember, it's not like be, them living all in one city, like C Capernaum, which was Jesus' home base on the Jewish side. Uh, these people were from a region of 10 towns, Decapolis. So their homes are spread over a large land. Verse 4, then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? At first glance, it's like these disciples are saying the same thing that they were saying a short time ago in chapter 6, verse 36, on the board, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. It's like they're saying the same thing. But you know, that's not what they're saying here. That's not what they're saying here in verse 4. I can imagine that Jesus was hoping, you know what, I wish you disciples would just say, hey, Jesus, you did this before, you can do it again. You know, he just wished for that. I'm sure Jesus was saying, can't you just say it? No, they didn't say that. Now, we cannot hear their tone of voice. So it's either a skeptical statement that they're making or maybe one of prejudice or possibly both. And what I mean by that is a skeptical statement is saying, how is this going to work, Jesus? How are you going to do this? We can't do this. How are you going to do this? Kind of like what they said on the board here in 636. But that means that they've completely forgotten about the feeding of the 5,000 for them to make that kind of skeptical statements. A lot of people who were disciples of Jesus Christ forgot about the previous miracle. A lot of people feel that way. And today, Christians simply forget a miracle-working power of God Almighty <laughs> in their lives. And God answers their prayer, or, or the miracle happens, and guess what? They're, they're jumping around. They're saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God for what he's done. And what happens two months later? Go on. History. I don't know what you're talking about. We quickly forget turn cold. I think of the children of Israel while Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. And uh, in Exodus 32, the people were growing impatient. They said to Aaron, they said, they said, make us gods, small g, make us gods. They, what did they do? They created this gold calf to be their idol. I got to have something to worship. And they had forgotten what God had done in bringing them out of the land of Egypt, uh, opening the waters, providing their food, raiment, having everything that they needed. It's easy for us to forget, isn't it? It's easy for us just to, I, I don't know what you're talking about, what God has done, and more importantly, what God is doing. In present day, look what God is doing. We can easily just, boop. But David sang the song in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget them. Don't forget. We should never forget what the Lord's doing, ever, what he is doing. But interestingly, that's not the word choice here in this text today. We need to consider the original text in our context today. When the disciples said, how can one satisfy, in your text, how can one satisfy these people? The original text for the word these, kept, follow me on this, is an accusative case, which means that they're referring to a direct object, which means that they are talking about the people. These people which in the Greek simply means that these disciples were more concerned about who the people are, th if they're Jews or Gentiles, than if Jesus could feed them at all. It's not about if Jesus could do it. It's about who they are. Because Jesus, well, in the accusative case, this is leaning towards a question of prejudice. And a lot of the past few chapters have been 
about Jesus trying to get people to understand, get the disciples to understand specifically about one simple truth, that Jesus is the bread of life. That's the focus. The disciples had participated in Jesus feeding 5,000 people. They were there, but now Jesus has compassion on 4,000 Gentiles. That's different. We only have freedom from prejudice when we unify under the simple fact that Jesus is for all of us. Every one of us. And I thank God for the bread of life that's available to the Jews and the Gentiles, for all of us. So is mankind in our text forgetful? Or is mankind prejudiced? Since we can't hear the tone of voice, um, I'm going to go with both. I see both in our text today. And we'll see later in our text how that works out. Again, in context. Verse 5, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Jesus is speaking directly to the disciples, and he, and he put the issue in their lap. Hey, disciples, what's in, your, what's in your hand? Last time, Jesus was talking to the young boy about the young boy's uh, provision of that lunch, right? That's, that's who it was. This time, um, it's, when, it's their own supply. It's their own, hey, what do you got in your hand? <laughs> We've heard that question before in Scripture. Exodus chapter 4, the Lord said to Moses, what is in your hand? Remember? And Moses said, a rod. And the Lord said, cast it on the ground. Huh. God gives us exactly what we need, and it's our choice to use those tools, to use those talents, use those gifts, or not. So the disciples respond in verse 5, look at it. They said, seven, seven loaves. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. This is very similar to what we saw in chapter 6. Jesus always starts with one thing, give thanks. This is not, please bless my food, this is, thank you, God. You see the difference? Thank you, Lord. And that's what was happening. It's an ex excellent example for us. And then they broke that bread one time, which is like Jesus was broken one time on the cross for you and me. And in the original text, it says he kept on giving. We talked about this in chapter 6. He kept on giving. The miracle was happening right in his hands. And the disciples, they run back and forth, and they are distributors of this miracle that was happening in Jesus' hands. They're constantly distributing. He gave, and the disciples were the distributors. We are the distributors every day. If you missed that Bible study in Mark chapter 6, I encourage you, go back and listen to that in YouTube. Listen to that, Mark 6. Verse 7, they also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said, he said to set them also before them. I have to say that three times fast. Um, the part of our storyline here is a little different than the feeding of the 5,000. And for some reason, the fish, uh, they didn't come into the picture until after the bread is multiplied and distributed. And I thought about this for a long time, and I just can't tell you why that is. Uh, some have said that disciples needed to see what Jesus was going to do first. <laughs> We're going to check out what he's got first in mind um, with those bread. And, and they weren't going to give all their bread to Jesus until they could check him out first. Um, well, what are you going to do with that, Jesus? It's, let me see first, you know. Um, we know that this isn't the way it works. That's not the way it works. We know that God calls us to walk by faith and not by sight. So while I believe that I need to follow God with everything I am and everything in my life, I'm not sure I agree with the idea that what's happened here with the fish is in that way because of one simple thing. Our text doesn't specifically say so. It doesn't say it one way or another. 
So I'm not going to be dogmatic about one way or another on this, but it's a unique difference between chapter 6 and chapter 8 to make note of. Verse 8, so they ate and were filled and took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000. This is a cool thing that happens at the end of the meal. I mean, they gather more bread than they started with. It's not that just everybody was full. It was like, that's pretty cool. That happened at the end of chapter 6. Um, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. The first miracle had 12 baskets, remember? 12 baskets of leftovers. That's the original text. It's like a small lunch bag sandwich, uh, basket. It's not, not a very large basket. But the second time, this seven large baskets, this is like, like the size of a hamper, like a laundry hamper. Um, the original text, it tells us that it's really large, like uh, one of the large baskets that are used to lower Paul down uh, over the wall of Damascus in Acts chapter 9, verse 25. You can read that on your own. Um, but everybody was, gonna, was filled to the gills. Everybody's got plenty, thank you very much. And there's leftovers, plenty to spare. We had a nice dinner at, at our home last night, and the refrigerator's full, and I've got lunch now for all week long. You know what I'm saying? That's what they had. They had plenty. Verse 9 continues, And he sent them away, immediately got into the boat with his, his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmanutha. So the people are spiritually fed for three days. They get plenty there, and now they're physically fed. And this is the compassionate Jesus, um, who has no problem at this point sending them away. He did before. That was an issue. But now, no problem at all because they are fed physically, spiritually. And Jesus and the disciples, they crossed the Sea of Galilee, and they head west on their way to Dalmanutha. And it's interesting that this is the only time in all the Bible that that name, Dalmanutha, is actually uh, showing up in Scripture. Actually, Mark's gospel um, says that Jesus went to the area of Magdala, which actually is the same place. Same place. Dalmanutha was the ancient Greek name of the same place. And this Dalmanutha, or Magdala, is notable for really one simple reason. There's a woman named Mary Magdalene. You remember her? She, um, she's one of those people with a rough past, a sordid past. And the one who Jesus cast out seven demons from her life. She later follows Jesus and was the first person to see the resurrected Jesus after three days in the tomb. Pretty cool place. Pretty cool in her life, what, what God had given her. So this Mary Magdalene is from Magdala. You can figure that out. And so she's different, very, very different compared to all the other quote-unquote religious leaders. Why? Because of her humility, because of her love for the Lord. These religious leaders, they weren't there. Verse 11, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, with him seeking from him a sign from heaven testing him. It's clear that Jesus had been doing miracles. The whole land, everybody knew it. Lots of people following. We have got a lot of history on that. We've already read that. So most people think this isn't a request to perform some type of healing. Go ahead and heal this person again. Go ahead and, and let's see demons cast out. No, that's, that's not where he was going. But back, remember back in 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, there's a man named Elijah. And when Elijah was there, he was building, he building an altar. He built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made this trench around that altar. He filled that trench four times with water. And water was all over the place. And then he prays, O oh Lord, hear me. Verse 38 picks it up. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed that burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now that is a sign from God. 
But these Pharisees in verse 11, uh, they weren't just meeting Jesus uh, at the shoreline and saying, hey, friend, come on in. <laughs> Wasn't a fine how do you do at all. Uh, it was not a friendly encounter. It wasn't. They, oh, their text says, they came out and began to dispute with him. And then at the end, it says that they were testing him, which is translated, they were tempting him. These Pharisees were tempting Jesus Christ to perform a miracle and some sort of sign. And who does that remind you of? Jesus had been tempted before and been through this before. It's in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan was tempting Jesus to do something. Go ahead and Je you do something, Jesus. Verse 3, if you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. <laughs> Verse 6, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. And verse 9, all these things I, Satan says, I will give you if you fall down and worship me. I wonder if we've ever been tempted to do, do anything that's out of bounds. Sure we have. Every day. Every day. I mean, we face similar temptations every day. And we, they're all summed up in 1 John for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Mm. The lust of the flesh is that temptation to get any pleasure physically from some type of sinful activity. Things like sexual sin, drug use, even gossip. The list goes on and on. Any pleasure physically, and that the Bible says is out of bounds, that God's Word's clear. God's Word's very clear on this, that there are things in my life that if, we, if I go there, it's going to hurt me. If you go there, it'll hurt you. Ephesians 5, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any other kind of impurity of, or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Not even a hint. Hmm. The second statement is the lust of the eyes, that temptation to look and to keep on looking <laughs> at something that we shouldn't be looking at, to keep going. It's coveting something with my eyes. I want that. Something that's got visual appeal. I want that. I, but I can't have that. In the 10th commandment, it says in Exodus 20, you shall not covet. And if we're staring, if we're, if we're wanting something or someone that God has not given to us, that is lust of the eye. Something like pornography. Looking at someone who is not yours. Coveting of money. Wanting somebody else's money. Somebody else's job. Somebody else's wife or husband. Flirting with someone who is not my wife. <laughs> Flirting with someone of the opposite sex who is other than your mate. Other, unless God has given you that person, that item, the simple command is, don't go there. Just don't go there. And the third is the pride of life. It's that sinful temptation that pushes for more. More power. More glory. More me. Ah, yeah. If we have an issue with the pride of life, we're saying... I want to make, make a name for myself. It's me. I want to feel important. Jesus said in Mark, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servants. Jesus is really saying here, if that's what you want, you get there by serving. And what happens when we serve? Our heart changes. God changes me from the inside out. And no longer is it about me, it's about him. I don't think it's breaking news to tell you that uh, temptation is challenging. 
I don't think that's a surprise, but God always provides a way out uh, for this temptation. Always. Look at 1 Corinthians. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide you a way out. So what? So that you can endure it. And so be encouraged. All of us need to be encouraged. Uh, we will all walk through the fires of temptation. But you know what? God is faithful. And we will not go through anything that's too tough. God will always make a way where there seems to be no way. So back to our text in verse 11. Uh, Jesus shows up on the shore and he says, Hi, guys, to the Pharisees. They don't respond in the same way. <laughs> they seemed a little bit miffed. And they want Jesus to um, show them a really big miracle. Come on, showtime here. Not just another healing like we've seen. Verse 11, excuse me, verse 12. Um, but he sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Jesus is saying here, um, we're not doing this. We're not going here, guys. And he knew that these religious leaders, they were setting themselves up as his enemies. They were interested in themselves. They were not interested in following him. That's not where they were going. They just wanted a, a show. They just wanted to have their own issues. Uh, it was about their own pride. And the miracles were not done, by the way, for show. Jesus never did any of the miracles for show. Um, or even to try to change somebody's mind. Hey, if I do this miracle, then will you follow me? That was never the, the objective. But the miracles were done to prove God's mercy. The miracles were done to show his love for his people. Jesus is all merciful. And the miracles that happen today in your life and in my life are not done for show. Uh, they're showing us that God is indeed merciful, that God loves us, that he cares for his children, how much he loves us. So verses 1 through 8, uh, Jesus is caring for all of these people, has compassion on these people, these Gentiles, surprise, surprise, uh, then verses 9 through 12, Jesus is being tempted by these religious leaders, and he's saying, you know what, we're not going there. And now picking it up in verse 13, um, these next few verses for me are at the heart of the text here today. Verse 13, and he left them, that means the Pharisees, and getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. So this time he's heading north again to this area called Bethsaida which we'll read about next week, Lord willing. Verse 14, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them when they got in the boat. This section is not about forgetting bread, or oops, we've got to make some more. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is a very important verse, however, because it sets the stage to what is most important. And where people's minds are focused, and what people think about. It seems like it's, it's a quick boat launch, you know, like it's a hurry up, we got to get going. And the disciples, they forgot to pack their lunch from all their leftovers. I mean, they had, a lot of, they had plenty of supply there, but things happen like fast. And when things are happening in a hurry, sometimes you just forget, right? You just forget. One Sunday morning, we lived in, this is years ago, back in upstate New York, and uh, we were leaving church. My mother-in-law was with us. Uh, we had just had baby number three. Our son Gabriel was just a newborn, and my mother-in-law was visiting us from California, and our kids are probably now, by this time, ages four, two, and zero. Uh, but it was a winter morning, and uh, we thought we had loaded up everybody in our car. You can hear where this is going. <laughs> Sharon's mom, she got situated in the back seat. We had car seats all over the place. Um, and we pulled out of the parking lot in the snow, and we were maybe a half a block down the road. 
maybe just not very far at all. And it was a service road, so there's not a lot going on. When all of a sudden, Sharon screams out, where's Olivia? <laughs> well, well, our two-year-old Olivia had gotten up to the car door and then just kind of turned left and just went off and started playing in the playground with the snow all around. She was having a good time. And uh, as soon as I heard, where's Olivia? Screech! You know, I'm sliding in the snow. It was fun. <laughs> but there's Olivia just standing there kind of doing one of these things, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we get in a rush and we forget things. I bet if we did an open mic, every one of you would have a similar story. Oh, uh, yeah. Verse 15, then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Jesus is not saying, you guys are dopes for coming here without bread. He's not saying that. He's saying, you forgot bread, that's one thing. But it's more important to not forget what? Sin. Not forget false teaching. This is the keep of the whole study today. Sin and false teaching will kill you. Don't forget that. That's what he's saying. That's the big teaching. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand this. And he said, take heed, beware of the, le of the leaven of, of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Jesus is saying, I don't care that you forgot about the bread. I do care that you pay attention to what is really important. And Jesus really, really wants them to understand this. Understand what? First, a few definitions. Leaven is a pinch of yeast or leftover dough uh, from a previous batch if you were making sourdough bread. Uh, it's, that could be used for the entire lump of, of bread area, to, of dough to rise, to puff up. So you probably know that it only takes a little bit of yeast to have an effect on the whole loaf. It permeates. It spreads. So the leaven in the Bible is seen as a picture of sin, a picture of evil. And it just takes a little bit of that sin that gets inserted in my life. <laughs> and it grows. And that sin grows. And it grows. It takes over my whole life. Jesus said, beware of the leaven. Watch out for any of the evil way of the Pharisees and of Herod. Beware of that. That means pay attention and be thinking about the sin of the Pharisees. What is that path of the Pharisees? Well, like leaven, it grows and rises, right? It grows and rises. Sin is always growing. Sin will be in my life. And in the leaven of the Pharisees is that, is that continued growth of legalism. That's who they are. We talked about this at length a few weeks ago. Um, we, we just know that that legalism will overwhelm, that Pharisees wanted people to, to follow rituals. And they were the big H word, hypocrites. A lot of people didn't like it when I said that word because they were like, whoops, he's talking to me. <laughs> Their sin was not going to stop. The sin was going to continue to permeate. And they were not interested, these folks, in God's mercy. But instead, they wanted God to show his power. Go ahead, God, show your power, Jesus. And at their command, if I tell you to do it, Jesus, you will do it. Uh, their belief system was full of leaven. <laughs> I mean, it was permeating everything that they did and said. Um, Jesus said, beware of this legalism. Beware of the hypocrisy. Watch out. And don't think being religious will get you anywhere. It's not gonna. In fact, their thinking is full of sin. And, and it will spread throughout every area of your life. And he's, he's asking them in context, do you understand this? Do you get it? Jesus said, uh, beware of the leaven of Herod. 
Remember the Herods back in chapter 6? We had a family tree up on the screen for you. And we could see that Herod Antipas and the family, uh, they were trying to bring about this righteousness through this political rule, this control. And Herod Antipas uh, and his wife Herodias, wife slash niece slash sister-in-law, uh, <laughs> um, they were the ones who killed John the baptizer. And they were all about getting more power and more authority, getting what they wanted when they wanted it. And yeah, they got what they wanted all right, but you know what else happened? Where did it lead them? Suicide. Untimely death. And Jesus said, beware of this grasping for control. Watch out. It is a spreading sin thinking that you're doing what's right on the inside when, in fact, you've got more and more sin in your life. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the, the pride of life, that sin that keeps growing inside of you, like leaven, it will tear you down. And guess what it says? The wages of sin is death. And he's asking in context, do you understand? Do you get it? This isn't about Jesus, about these guys forgetting uh, God and his power. It's not that they forgot. It's about our choices. It's Jesus saying, beware of legalism. Beware of worldly compromise. Because neither of these will bring about peace and joy. It just won't go there. It won't happen. Verse 16. And the disciples, they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. Oops, we don't have any bread. We forgot it. Who, you were supposed to bring it. It's like they didn't have anything in the glove box or something, right? All they had was enough for one loaf. And the disciples really thought that Jesus was giving them a talking to about this physical leaven. It was all this physical, all because they forgot the bread. <laughs> no, that's not it. Wrong answer. And Jesus is talking about spiritual ideas here and not about physical bread. And they weren't putting any of this together. I mean, here's Jesus, and he's saying, he's asking now a series of questions, nine of them in all. Look at your text, verse 17. Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, number one, why do you reason because you have no bread? Number two, uh, do you not yet perceive nor understand? Don't you get it? It's almost like Jesus had to get in their face because they were, they were acting like they didn't understand. Number three, verse 17, is your heart still hardened? Number four, having eyes, do you not see? Number five, and having ears, do you not hear? Number six, and do you not remember? I mean, look what Jesus has already done. Um, and this is one of those times where we wish we, we could hear the tone of voice. I mean, is Jesus angry? Is he frustrated? But I can't believe you guys. Is he, is he thinking that they're acting like children? Verse 19, number 7, when I broke the five loaves of the, for the 5,000, how many baskets of fragments did you take up? And they answered to him, 12. Number 8, also when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they, and they said seven. And verse 21, number 9, and he said to them, how is it you do not understand? How do you get, how do you not get, I don't, I don't get how you don't get. Jesus has been faithful. Jesus is faithful. Jesus will always be faithful. Always. And the ob they obviously remember the miracles. It's not a question of forgetting because they knew the thousands, they knew the numbers, but something didn't click and, and they didn't understand the effect of some of these things. What was it that they simply did not understand? I'd like to offer you three things today that they didn't understand. We find them through the answers of what we just read in our text, starting in verse 15. They didn't understand the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, that is the false teaching, uh, the legalism that can grow in a person's life, and it can take many forms, including hypocrisy, uh, rules, regulations, 
religiosity. So to truly understand what God wants me to know, I should prayerfully be asking the Lord, Lord, like leaven, what areas in my life am I allowing sin to grow? Lord, is there any legalism that's growing in my life? Lord, in my mind, in my heart, am I letting traditions rule my life? This is important. God wants us to understand that allowing sin in my life that will grow in my life will be, put a stranglehold on my life. It'll put a stranglehold on us. So we need to ask God to show us, to reveal to us, to help us understand, to confess that sin. Repent and turn around and run. Number two, the leaven of Herod from verse 15. That is the false teaching, this political rule and, and compromise. And to truly understand what God wants me to know. Truly, I should be prayerfully asking the Lord, Lord, what areas in my life am I trying to control? Am I trying to have more power and more authority instead of humbling myself before you and Almighty God? It's important that God wants me to know, understand that controlling my life will get me zero. That will get me nowhere. So we need to ask God to show us. Show us, Lord. Reveal to us. Help us understand when we're letting this sin of pride come in, this, this control to rule over me and giving that sin space to grow in my life because it'll strangle me, it'll kill me. Lord, help me to understand what's happening. I confess that sin to you, God. What else did they not understand? Number three, the hard heart. From verse 17, and God is asking if they still had a hard heart. Do you have a hard heart? And maybe they, that's why they didn't understand what he's saying, because their heart was seared. Hard. A hard heart is that heart that's failing to remember all the good that God has done for you. All the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And for us to truly understand what God wants us to know, our prayer should be something like this. Lord, <laughs> what has my heart grasped? Why is my heart so hard? towards you. Lord, just reveal it. Show me. Why is my heart so hard? And what can be done, Lord, to soften my heart? What do you want to do? Because this is important. This is a big deal. We can see that there's a straight line between a hard heart and our relationship with him. God, show us when we're forgetting what you have in mind, all the good that you have done. All that you've done. I ask that the water of your word would soften my heart like, like, like hard clay would now be softened. The washing of the water of the word of God would be, take over and that you, Lord, would take first place. I confess my sin to you. Let's spend some time in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for your word and we read this and we want to respond now to your word. We honor you, we worship you as our God. We thank you, God, that you love us so much. And Lord, we want to understand what you're teaching us, that this leaven, this sin is come into our life and we're giving it place to allow it to grow. Father, we pray, we confess our sin and we ask you to wash us, forgive us, cleanse us, purify us. And as we confess that sin, Lord, we ask you to forgive. We ask you to soften our hearts. Refresh my heart, I pray. <laughs> Refresh us. We'd hear your voice and walk in your plan. 
Lord, we want to understand. We want to hear and be directed by you. We want to humbly follow you. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you. You are doing a good work in maturing us as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?